Thanks for coming, and uh, I'd like to introduce Andy Nichols, who's going to tell us all about creating fabulous user interfaces for virtual reality using Qt. Andy? Yeah, thank you. So uh, thanks for choosing my talk. I know that there was another couple of uh, awesome talks going on at the same time, but uh, glad you chose mine. And uh, this is uh, the you know talk on creating user interfaces for virtual reality. And uh, yeah, let's just dive right in. Uh, for those who don't know who I am, uh, I'm Andy Nichols, and I work for the Qt Company. I've I've worked uh, well, maybe not for the Qt Company, but for Trolltech, Nokia, Digia, and then the Qt Company. It's been almost ten years. I've been you know in the same office in Oslo, Norway. Uh, you know, working with Qt, doing things with Qt. Uh, it's a couple of pictures here. The, this one over here, that, that's actually from my house in Norway. It is a beautiful country <laughs> that you should visit if you haven't before. And what, I, what I've been doing in the Qt company is I'm actually part of the graphics team. Uh, maybe before you've seen uh, some of my other talks, uh, usually talking about embedded, but uh, graphics is my passion. And uh, today you get, to, you get to see a part of that. Uh, actually exploring some things with Qt graphics. So just to give a quick overview of what we'll actually be covering in this talk, uh, uh, the first thing I actually want to do is uh, lay out what the actual challenges are of creating uh, user interfaces for virtual reality. Uh, and, and in part, this is actually uh, overlaps with the challenges of creating any user interface in, in a 3D scene, uh, because there are some new challenges that you actually have to consider and then, uh, in addition to that, uh, there's additional input methods that you need to uh, take into consideration that uh, aren't exactly the same when using, you, doing user interfaces for computers or tablets or mobile devices. After that, uh, I want to give an overview by example of the actual state of using virtual reality with Qt right now, what's possible today with Qt 5.9. And then uh, I'll share with you some of the things that's being researched right now in the Qt space, uh, what we're looking, f looking into doing in the future with Qt and, and what's possible. And then I'll finish off with some tips uh, of how you can actually uh, you know, have a good user experience, like some big don't do these things uh, with virtual reality interfaces. So let's uh, get started here. So uh, this is actually. Uh, Minecraft, uh, maybe a lot of you are familiar with it. It's uh, <laughs> owned by Microsoft now, but uh, they actually have a very nice uh, VR uh, beta to actually try out. And one of the things you may notice here is that actually there are a lot of you know familiar UI concepts if you've played Minecraft before. But now you know in VR, uh, the positioning is very you know different. It, it how they behave is, is very different, and this actually brings up that. Uh, it, it, it's quite different to, to create uh, user interfaces in a 3D world. And if you're doing VR, you are going to be you know, part of a 3D scene. So we have to kind of break that down a little bit uh, into the types of user interfaces uh, when doing things in 3D. Uh, and I guess it breaks down to uh, this, this simple matrix here, uh, which we'll, we'll explore in the next few slides. Uh, but it boils down to uh, where, where the uh, UI actually exists at. Is it part of the 3D world? And then in addition to that, is it part of the world? Does it exist in that scene uh, and is part of that scene? So just to start, start with, uh, the first type of UI is actually uh, called diegetic. And maybe this isn't a word that, that you're familiar with, especially in this context. But this actually means uh, something that's part of the world. Uh, the, the comparison in that, I guess, made me understand was uh, in, in the movie space, there's this concept of diegetic music versus you know, non-diegetic sounds or music or sounds. So the difference being that a non-diegetic sound is you know, the soundtrack that's actually the score that's being played over the movie. Like You as the audience can hear it, but the characters in the scene can't hear it. Whereas a diegetic sound or, or, or music would be if the characters were at a concert and, you know, they can hear the music, you can hear the music, it's part of the world. So as far as 3D user interfaces go, uh, 
the, these diegetic user interfaces are interfaces that are part of the world. So this is actually an example from uh, Nintendo's Splatoon. And it has a good example of a diegetic user interface. So on the back of the player character, there's actually a, a tank of ink. And this, this is your ammo. Uh, and a, as you expend your ink, the levels go down. And you can see everybody else's ink levels just by looking at their back. So this, this is an example of a diegetic user interface. Some other examples would be uh, in-game uh, objects like smartwatches and tablets. And if you actually had that in the game, uh, it exists as in the physical space. And uh, it, well, that, that's pretty much all, all there is to that. In VR, these are actually uh, our diegetic user interfaces are very, very great because uh, it makes things more immersive. This is actually taken from uh, this, a game called Elite Dangerous. And here, uh, in your VR headset, you can look around in your cockpit, uh, like, which feels like a physical cockpit. And as you look around, user interface elements are popping in into the scene and you can see them in real time. So they're popping up and they exist in that physical space as part of that world. Uh, Non-diegetic non UIs uh, in 3D user interfaces are things that uh, are not part of the world. So th traditionally, this would be your heads-up displays. So again, taken from Nintendo's Splatoon, all of the, the, the user interface elements around the frame, which is you know, when you're, it's very similar to when you're doing 2D user interfaces. It's just attached to the camera and it, right there in the world, uh, or not in the world, but in, you know, on the screen, into screen space. So uh, that's another option for, and very common option for doing uh, UIs in, in 3D, 3D user, for user, 3D user interfaces. Uh, in VR, uh, these aren't great, uh, and generally you're not going to do them because they're typically rendered in screen space, and with a VR headset, you know, screen space is your face. So you end up in a scenario where uh, if you were to do it, you're actually rendering things you know, very close to the face that follow the face around, and it, it's not a very good user experience. It's actually possible to implement these uh, with the, like, there are ways to do it with layers, overlay layers in the, like, the head-mounted display SDKs, but generally this isn't done uh, because of poor user experience. Uh, uh, this, uh, this next, the next type of, of user interface is uh, spatial uh, user interface elements. These exist inside of the 3D scene without being part of it. So a good example of this is that if you're in a 3D scene and uh, other user interface or other elements in the scene are labeled, like for example, if you're playing a multiplayer uh, game and someone has their name above their head, that text label that has their name exists in 3D space, but it doesn't physically exist in the world. It's a fictional thing. It's kind of like the AR in VR, <laughs> or the a augmented reality in the fake reality, uh, overlaying something on top of something in space. Uh, a good example of that in VR, uh, again taken from, from Minecraft, is actually the cursor. So this cursor is a fictional element, and as it moves around in the scene, you can see that it actually changes the orientation that it's rotated based on where it's actually placed on the object. So it, if it's this way, or this way, or this way. One of the things you have to consider, though, when you're doing this is, uh, with any kind of spatial UI element in VR, is that you have to be careful about how close to the camera, how far away from the camera the spatial element is, and then you might have to scale the actual uh, element to reflect, uh, you know, a, be at a comfortable reading distance so it doesn't get too blurry or too far away. I mean. Any time in VR that you put something too close to your face, it just like in real life, it feels very uncomfortable like, like this. It's very unnatural to have something that close to your face. And then finally, uh, the, the last type in our user interface element matrix is this extra category, the meta category. And these are things that exist in the world but aren't uh, visualized spatially. Uh, I guess it, in, uh, in games, this is where I guess one of the best example is when you go from a transition between underwater to above water, and you can see water kind of dripping down your face. This is something that exists in the world, 
but not actually part of the world. In VR, uh, I think one of the best examples of this is in the Google Earth VR program. And the way this is done is that uh, when you're actually moving around in the scene, you kind of like click the ground and drag things around. And when you do that, it actually shrinks your field of view so that you're only looking at this. And, and this is more of a comfort thing. Uh, but uh, it, it's kind of tricky to do in VR just because it breaks, breaks the immersion because it's not, very, it's not a very natural thing. So that's, that's, that kind of breaks down uh, the user interface types that you have in 3D. Uh, the next thing uh, that you have to consider when you're making virtual reality interfaces is the different types of input methods that you'll have to uh, contend with. So the most naive approach is you know, say, oh, mouse and keyboard, that's what you're already using on your computer. Uh, and you know, many of the VR headsets uh, require to have a PC now that aren't a phone. Uh, but the problem with this, actually, is that uh, when you're wearing a VR headset, like, it obscures your view completely. And so first off, you, you know, you're feeling around for your keyboard. And then when you do find it, you, know, you better be a very good touch typist because it's, you can't see. You have to take the headset off to see. So it's very difficult to do, to do things that way. The second thing is that uh, when you're using a mouse, uh, I guess the, the typical control scheme in, in a 3D scene is this style, like first person shooter style camera, the FPS style camera, where the mouse actually points you where you're actually looking. Well, when you're in a VR headset, uh, this actually feels very unnatural to have your head move for you when you have free movement to look around, but then all of a sudden you move the mouse and your head's turning around and it, 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 it leads to motion sickness. So it, it's something you should not do anyway when you're developing your VR applications. Uh, as far as like input goes, it's not terribly hard to, to translate the picking for what, what I'm looking at and then the mouse, but it does require like flat surfaces uh, because when you're typically using a mouse and keyboard, uh, it's on your desktop and it's a flat surface. So it, it's an unusual experience in VR. The second thing is our game pads. This is the, the traditional console style uh, like input method. And at least when I got to my first headset, this is this was I got an Oculus Rift, and there uh, you got a game pad, you got an Xbox game pad along with it. And I guess this is slightly better than the mouse and keyboard scenario because it's in your hands, it's already there, and then you have you actually have the buttons. There's only a few things you can actually press, so it's not too hard to, to search around for the wrong thing. And at runtime, you can, anytime you're introducing new controls, you could actually show the gamepad on the screen and say like, oh, the X button is actually this one. And so they'll have an idea of where to move their thumb. Uh, the FPS style controls are still a thing, so you have to be conscious that you know, you're not turning with the thumbstick uh, just to, to prevent uh, you know, motion sickness. What's really cool about the, the modern uh, VR headsets is actually the hand controllers, because these, are, these make things super immersive, the, because once you're holding these hand controllers, uh, you can actually render them in the scene, and then it feels like you, know, you have hands. They're moving in the same, they're offset from the headset the same way. So it actually feels like your hands are moving in the scene, and it definitely makes things very immersive. And actually, from a programming standpoint, uh, the APIs that actually deal with these handsets, it, they're actually quite easy to use because what you get is a pose from each of the, the hand, hands, which is just an offset from where is your headset at, and then the rotation of the controller. And then from there, you can figure out exactly where I need to put them in the scene. Uh, let's see. Uh, the other cool thing about this is when you want to do picking, like the actual selecting of objects in the scene, you can create uh, in-scene pointers, like I like to draw laser beams out of the, the ends of the controller. So you can hold a button, it shoots out a green laser. Now you can point at anything in the scene. And I want to select that item. Uh, and this is quite nice. But one of the things you have to remember when doing this is that you know, normally when you're doing picking, you, you draw a ray, you cast a ray out from what would be you know, your point on the screen into the scene. But if you have hand controllers, you need to draw a ray from where the hand controller is and where it's 
the direction it's pointing in. So it's a, it's a little bit different, but uh, it does make for very cool input. Uh, and finally, and probably the most common thing, because not all VR headsets, especially these like Gear, Gear VR, or whatever it is, like the, the headset mounted ones, uh, or the phone based VR headsets, uh, they use gazed based tracking, which is, you know, as is shown here, is like whatever you're looking at, that element is then focused. And then you can take that one step further. And if I stay focused on this item for four seconds, then it's going to click it, basically. Or you could have some kind of indicator on the button that actually scrolls over and shows you how much longer you need to look at it before it actually selects it. So this actually ends up being fairly decent user experience, but you do need to consider when making your UI like placement of where you're popping in items. So for example, if you had like a menu in the previous scene and it clicked a button, don't immediately pop a button up in front of the face in the exact same position so that it might activate again instantly. Same thing with the time. You want to make sure that it's a comfortable time. I mean, I guess it's like any kind of UI development. You need to be testing and iterating and seeing what's actually comfortable and works well. OK, so I guess that gives a pretty good overview of like the, the maybe the theory of doing you know, user interfaces in VR, both the spatial side as well as the input side. So let's take a look at what's actually possible right now in Qt with the existing released Qt uh, as far as VR goes. So first thing that I did was I actually you know, took something that exists already, which is, in this case, it's the Unity 3D engine, which is, you know, it's a game engine. It's very popular with indie games. And, you know, that supports VR. Uh, and I said, okay, I can, I can put Qt into that. And in this case, this would qualify in this particular scene because it's a Qt Quick user interface kind of floating in the middle of this pond here in this Unity scene. This is a diegetic user interface. It exists as part of the world. If there were other players, they'd see it. You can interact with it. You can grab it with the little lasers and, and, and interact with it. And, you know, that works right now. Uh, uh, what I did was actually, you know, create a, Unity has this concept of native plugins uh, where you can, like, take C++ code and actually, uh, like, load in a plugin and then do things with it. And it also exposes, like, a rendering API, so you can actually start doing custom rendering in Unity. Uh, so what I, what I have here is, you know, I use Qt 5.9.1. It was a static build because uh, everything needs to be like self-contained in a DLL, so I can't have like lots and lots of cute plugins everywhere. Um, that's the latest Unity that I had access to at the time. I think it might still be the latest release. And then, of course, the most wonderful class that we have in Qt, at least Qt Quick, uh, Qt Quick Render Control, which makes everything possible. All the magic that I'm doing with all of these things is with Qt Quick Render Control, which is a class that allows you to take a cute quick scene and render it to an off-screen surface and then use it somewhere, anywhere, and it's just a texture. And then it also provides facilities to you know, pipe, pipe information back, or at least you, you have the facilities to pipe input back. And so you can see here kind of if, I don't know, how many of you actually used Unity before? OK, so a few. Well, if you have, this, this might look very familiar. This is like the, the property panes from from Unity, uh, showing a couple of different things that I actually did. Uh, up at the top, I guess, is the most important thing. That's pretty much the extent of the, the API I created was, how big do you want a texture, and what QML file do you want to load? And then it's going to load that file, and then that'll show up in your scene and be interactable. Well, interactable because of touch. This is kind of what the architecture looks like. And you might notice something quite funny about this chart, and that's in the middle, is that it's a direct X11 texture. That's a bit of an unfortunate thing that uh, Unity 3D, at least with the Oculus headset, uh, only, like the renderer only supports rendering to DirectX 11 for whatever reason. Uh, so unfortunately, on the Qt side, which we don't actually support rendering to DirectX 11, uh, I have to do a little bit of funny business uh, to uh, capture, capture the content and do some inefficiencies. So, so what's actually happening is I render with OpenGL, uh, this gets read back, which is super expensive and you should never do. <laughs> and then I re-upload re that uh, to DirectX. 
It's also possible to use the software render, and in some cases it makes it even faster because the readback is just that expensive, but you can't do everything with Qt Quick with just the software render. But that's basically what it looks like, and it's all the visual stuff in Qt Quick are through render control that gets mapped to the DirectX texture, which I can apply to anything in the Unity 3D scene. And uh, the other way around, if I want to send, say, touch events into the scene, uh, there's a separate plugin, and it just basically synthesizes uh, uh, Qt events to actually like simulate touches on the Qt side. Uh, like I said, it's a, a Unity uh, C++ plugin, and the interface is quite light for for Unity, like Unity plugins. It's so basically it's a load the plugin, unload the plugin, and then these two render functions here, like that enables me to have a callback so that I can render things on the Unity thread. And then from there, I mean, that's the only Unity specific code up there. And then down here, that's basically the, the C++ side of the Qt interface. These are functions that are exposed to the Unity script side. So basically pump the event loop, update the animations, and then some marshalling between the textures and like what QML file to load, where does the texture come from, and then sending the touch events over. Pretty, pretty simple stuff. And then of course on the other side, you have uh, the C sharp side, which is basically take all of this exposed C++ plugins and, and use them inside of C sharp, which is uh, the .NET runtime or mono runtime is what Unity is using. So, but that's basically it uh, for that. Uh, unfortunately, I can't share the code for this yet, uh, and I'd like to make that publicly available if possible, but uh, I guess if you follow me on Twitter, as soon as it actually happens, uh, and I can release the code or have some information about that, I, I can let you know and, and share that with you. Um, but it, it should be possible to you know recreate a lot of what, what was done there. Uh, it's not super, super complicated. Um, the next thing is that, uh, let's say I didn't want to use you know, some self-contained world like Unity. I mean, it is just a big monolithic game engine. But rather, I wanted to render myself. Uh, I have an external render already that I want to incorporate and start rendering to a headset uh, and actually display something. Um, and then, I also want to take that content and mirror it to a window so I can see exactly what's going on. So I created an example, which does have source code and I can share with you, uh, that uh, in this case uses Ogre 3D to render to an Oculus headset via the Oculus SDK. Ogre 3D is an open source rendering engine if you're not familiar with that. So it's just basically a way for me to render a 3D scene. And again, I'm using Qt 5.9, the released version, no extra hacks, the released Qt. And here, you can see the actual mirrored output from my example. And one of the things you might notice is that that looks very bizarre. I mean, it's not, it's not perfect. The example's not perfect. Uh, I'm actually not the best Ogre 3D uh, expert out there. So hopefully, some of you guys are. And uh, you can make it look pretty, but the actual rendering is good or at least the, the plumbing is good. So I don't want you to get too intimidated by uh, this particular chart, because it's kind of complicated. But this is actually the architecture of this example of how you can incorporate an external, external renderer and render to a VR headset. So I guess I've broken it down into three separate sections here. So on this side, uh, this would be like the pure cute side, uh, like actually rendering to a cute window. And the only thing that you really, in this case, need to render to the Qt window is the mirrored content of the VR headset. So whenever you're displaying to the head-mounted display, it just shows up as one large texture for each eye. And then you can actually capture that and put it on the screen so you're not having to render the scene for a third time because that you definitely, you're already having to render the scene twice, once from each eye, and you really don't want to have to render it a third time or a fourth time if you're rendering both of those things. So uh, in the case of the Oculus, the Oculus headset, the way that it works, and we'll look at this Oculus render side, is that 
Typically what you do is uh, when you inst instantiate the headset, you actually request a texture swap chain. Uh, and this, this actually would be a way that, you know, it's kind of like the buffering situation where at one point in time, one buffer is on the headset and then two buffers are, you know, available to, you know, render to. So you render to one, it's waiting to go to the headset and then when you're, when you're ready for it to go, you submit the, submit the next frame and it just kind of flips around. It's similar to the way you know, triple buffering works with, with window surfaces. So you have three different textures, and then one of those textures you can also uh, use as your mirror texture. Uh, and so that's actually shared with uh, another like, OpenGL context that the mirror render will actually use. And the mirror render, I'll, I can show you the code for uh, shortly, it really just blitz, blitz this mirror texture to a window surface, which that just means copy, copy it to the surface. And then on the Ogre 3D side, uh, we're actually, this is where the textures that you're actually showing the eye, the 3D content, that's actually rendered to each one of these textures. Uh, so this is kind of a very simplified explanation of, of, the, of the Ogre side. But basically, you know, you have two different compositions, one for each eye, and it basically renders the scenes from two different perspectives. So yeah, here's some, here's some code. <laughs> Uh, this is actually the Oculus part. Uh, it's kind of separated into a few different blocks. But uh, first off, you know, when you're rendering to the headset, the first thing you want to do is, you know, get the current pose of the headset and, well, the hand controllers. You want to do that as late as possible uh, so that you have the most accurate tracking and the least latency. From there, if you're actually, you know, wearing the headset, so is visible, then you actually want to go through the rendering process. So uh, you'll get the current, the current uh, swap chain texture, and then you want to pass it to this renderer here. And this would be our ogre renderer that's responsible for rendering one frame and giving you a GL texture back so that you can uh, you know, use that uh, for the headset. So, and this is another uh, unfortunate thing uh, with this implementation, is that uh, with Ogre and uh, Q3D to a certain extent, uh, the Oculus headset actually gives you textures and say, hey, render to these. But unfortunately, Ogre and uh, Q3D and, and many other renderers, they like to create their own textures, and you can use those. So this is the case with, with Ogre as well, and without extra hacks. And so I actually have to do a texture blit here. So copy the texture that Ogre gave me to the Oculus headset texture. And now that works. And at least in the case of the Oculus headset, even when you're using you know, Steam or Valve's uh, OpenVR, uh, the exact same thing happens under the hood. It's going to you know, create a texture and copy it over in the same, using the same method. And then, of course, when you're done, you can commit the texture swap chain and submit that frame. And then it'll flip the buffer onto the screen, and you'll see the content in the scene. Uh, from the Ogre rendering side, I mean, this is, again, very simple. Uh, we pass in the pose. We update the player in the scene, so where the camera's actually located, what the angle it's at. And then we just render one frame in the scene at that particular time delta. So pretty simple stuff. And you can see here, we have to you know, do some magic to actually get the texture and we pass the texture ID back. And of course, like I said, the mirroring setup is pretty simple because all we have to do there is take the mirror texture that the Oculus renderer passes us and blit that to the screen. And you know, over half the code on this page is just setting the aspect ratio, so it really comes down to you know, set up GL, blit the texture, and we use the pretty cool QOpenGL texture blitter class. So if you've been writing lots of texture blitters with GL, and you use Qt, you should try this one now because I never want to have to write another texture blitter again. I know I will, but at least this makes it slightly easier. <laughs> and the source code is available for this, the full example. Uh, you can either scan this now or, of course, you know, click the link later in the references slide and just check out the example. And, of course, I'd love for you to fix it and make it awesome. Uh, so take it that, that next step. I think most of the plumbing work is there. It's just, it'd be really cool to have some cool ogre content in the scene and not just my very hacky example. So that's an ex example case. Uh, 
What I actually found when researching this is that there's a company right now that is shipping uh, an example that's uh, using Qt for user interfaces in VR. And that company is called High Fidelity. So we can see an example here. This tablet uh, that, that, that's being used here, that's actually a Qt Quick user interface uh, imposed onto this tablet. And this menu, the store that it showed there, that's actually Qt Web Engine running inside of this, this 3D scene. The other thing, I mean, you might not be able to see it, but in the background, there's actually walls or like, like signs. And these signs are web pages, like HTML web pages, and those are done with Qt Web Engine. Like all of the menus in this game are done with, with Qt Quick. Uh, and again, they're doing the same thing that I was doing in, in the, the Unity case, that they have their own renderer, and they're using Qt Quick render control to actually uh, render into this texture and then pipe the input. Same thing. The other thing is that High Fidelity is open source. It's a open platform for a, like a VR metaverse, you know, one of these places where you can exist, create content. It's a second life for VR. And I think it's actually done by one of the original founders, or this company was actually founded by one of the founders of Linden Labs, which did Second Life. So definitely something to check out and check out the code. So that's what you can do today with, with Qt. And, and you may have noticed that a lot of that was quite involved. That you, know, you really needed to know a lot about you know, plumbing Qt, plumbing things in, in OpenGL, a lot, of, a lot of extra work. So let's look at what's, what's coming down the road. So first thing is that uh, there's actually experimental patches right now on, on our code review system for uh, using Qt or Qt 3D with VR. So you can actually check out the patch there. Uh, I'm actually running, in this scene, this is one of the like, simple examples that actually is, is part of that patch. Uh, so you can see moving my head around. And that's actually done with the Oculus headset as well. But this patch is actually for the op uh, Valve's OpenVR. So it actually works with the, the HTC Vive as well, and maybe anything else that supports the, the headset. Uh, right now, it's uh, headset tracking only, uh, so it tracks where the head is, but it's not checking the poses of the, the hand controllers. And it's not part of Qt yet, and it still needs some work, uh, so it's you know, not going to be in 5.10. It'll be sometime in the future, or something like it will be there in the future. So the way that this actually works, uh, I drew a simple uh, architecture chart here, uh, is that uh, in Qt 3D, you know, you set up uh, a render target for the left eye and the right eye, which ends up, you know, being a couple of textures, like a color, color texture and a depth stencil texture. And uh, that sets up as a render target. You also have a left eye and right eye camera that are part of your, your actual scene. And then you have a frame graph that looks kind of like this. So basically it's setting up a viewport that's rendering the scene uh, for each one of these uh, render targets uh, from the perspective of the camera and then you know, just rendering it that way. So it basically renders the scene from the position of the cameras in the scene. And of course, if you have this uh, open VR submit command, then it'll make sure in the renderer to submit those textures you render to, render to, to the headset. And you know, maybe that, that previous example wasn't very exciting, and uh, I thought so too. So I wanted to show you a little bit more complicated example. And so I created a, another uh, Q3D-based example. As you may have heard in some of the previous talks, uh, we have this product called Q3D Studio. And uh, yeah, right now, it's using an engine uh, that was you know, donated by NVIDIA. But we've actually been working on a Q3D-based replacement for that runtime. And I know I've been working on this. And you know, I'm exploring VR and working on this. So I said, Surely I can make VR work with <laughs> the, our new runtime. So this is a result of that. So I'm actually, you know, rendering a car inside of a, I guess it's a, it's a sphere that's been inverted, like the normals are looking inward, and I'm mapping a 3D image. I don't know if you've seen like the 360 views on Google. Uh, so it's 
inside of the sphere. So you can look around, you can see the sphere, and then you can see the car placed there in the sphere. And it's you know, rendered from this perspective. And that's actually done with Qt3D. So yeah. Uh, but the cool thing is, is that I was able to actually you know, not create that you know, somewhat complicated code in C++, but rather I actually laid out the scene in Qt3D Studio. And yeah, this is a bit interesting because Qt3D Studio is normally a you know, layer-based renderer, so it's rendering each layer. So I added an API to where I can set one layer as a VR layer. Now the camera for that layer actually becomes a VR camera, and I can view the scene in my headset uh, from the perspective of, you know, as if I'm in the scene. Uh, so that's just a taste of, you know, what's possible, what's coming down the pipeline, what we're looking into. And uh, yeah, so hopefully a lot of cool things will be in that space and, you know, all of us will be able to use that soon. So that's kind of the state of things right now. Uh, you can see what's available now, what will be available in the future. Uh, now I just want to give just a few tips, a big no-no's what you shouldn't do when you're developing a uh, your user interface for VR. So the first thing is, is that you want to avoid thin lines and narrow fonts. And this is actually related to, uh, how many of you actually used a, a VR headset before? I guess that's, that's kind of important. So one of the things you might have noticed when you actually use the headset, eh, maybe less so with the newer ones, but you actually see the pixels. I mean, from the stats, I mean, it seems very high resolution. It's very expensive to render to. But like when it's like an inch from your face, like, you can see individual pixels, even if they're, they're quite small. And when you develop a UI that, you know, has one pixel thin lines, uh, these, these in-between spaces start to matter and things start to pop in and out of existence. So when you're developing your interface for VR, really bolden things up, have thick lines, uh, big, bold fonts, and then you'll actually be able to see them. They'll look good. The next thing is that, and I kind of mentioned this earlier, is that you never want to attach your user interface to the camera. And this comes back to, in virtual reality, it's, it simulates reality. If in real life, have you ever had a scenario where something is stuck to your face, and no matter what you do, you cannot escape this? Well, that's, that's what it's like in VR. It feels very unnatural, very unsettling, and it's a, a user experience that you don't want to experience. And finally, uh, when you're actually designing uh, controls for, say, touch controllers, uh, you have to remember that uh, fine movement is not something you can do with like, your hands. Uh, like, so for example, if you were to create a virtual keyboard with little tiny keys, like in real life, I'm trying to simulate this laptop, you know, maybe you should have just one big keyboard button. But if you had individual buttons, like actually pressing them with your controllers, is actually quite hard, so you might want to design as if, you know, instead you had sausages, and like, can I interact this interface with sausages? And if so, then that's probably closer to what you need. So you don't have that same dexterity that you have with multiple fingers and a keyboard. So just keep that in mind uh, when you're actually creating the sizing of your user interface. So in conclusion, uh, I guess we, we talked about, you know, the challenges of, you know, creating user interfaces for 3D and like extra things you have to consider when you're actually developing an interface that exists in a scene or around a scene. And then in VR, uh, there's additional challenges on top of that. So uh, we, we, we went over like what other things to consider. And then uh, you know, we, we went through what's possible today with Qt 5.9 and uh, what you what you might be able to do, considering that a lot of the things that I showed were somewhat involved and not very user-friendly, not very cute-like in, in the traditional sense, uh, but also that we're actually forward-looking and we're trying to figure out cute APIs for this, like how this uh, virtual reality fits into the bigger picture of cute and uh, what we can do in the future. And yeah, so that's it. Uh, I, uh, I really, really enjoyed having you guys here, and I would love it if you followed me on Twitter. I'm constantly posting there. Like, that's the way to figure out where all the cool things are happening. So uh, be great, and I'd like to hear from you. And so thanks a lot.
So th thanks very much, Andy. It's a great talk. Uh, we have time for a few questions, uh, if anybody would like to ask them. Let me toss this thing to you so we can hear you. Uh, do we have any estimation when uh, OpenVR will have a support for Linux? When OpenVR will have support for Linux? Because uh, currently, I think it's only for Windows platform, right? Oh, so so at least with Oculus, that only is Windows specific, but or and now Mac, but for OpenVR, it's supposed to be uh, cross-platform already, including Linux. Okay, yeah, so 32-bit only. Okay, but, thank you. Okay. Right, Any more for that. Anybody questions? else? Don't be shy. <laughs> And you can always ask later if you are feeling shy. <laughs> uh, coming. Can you cut it? <laughs> Good job. It's soft. <laughs> now, I was thinking about uh, um, Google Glasses. That is a different approach in that case. Because you said, yeah, you said before that uh, uh, it is better to avoid to attach to the camera the UI, you know? Mm -hmm. But in that case, uh, with the Google Glasses, they attach, in fact, the UI to the camera. So, yeah, I think I think that's that's actually uh, I didn't mention in this talk, but when I was thinking about before with non-diegetic UIs, like the only thing I could think of in reality that had this was the Google Glass, which of course had a lot of negative connotations, and it, it does feel unnatural. And most people haven't actually experienced uh, what Google Glass is like. So it is, but that is an example of sort of a non-diegetic UI in reality, but it's, it's not a very natural thing. So it's, and of course, Google Glass itself is probably more AR-ish, but it's, it's a HUD. It's a HUD for you individual. So yeah, sure, it's, it's comparable. Thank you. Yep. One more over here. Oh. <laughs> 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 Yep. Oh. All right. So uh, you haven't mentioned it, but uh, uh, another way of, you know, in, as, a, as a way of input would be voice, right, and sound. So that's yes. one of the things that kind of goes hand in hand because your hands are usually doing something in VR. And uh, you, do you see more role there as a, as a way of input? So thinking of voice recognition and then synthesize as a response, et cetera. So kind of removing that element as a direct visual input or interaction. No, I think, that's, I think that's an interesting point. I didn't mention uh, voice as an input method, but that is something that at least we're looking to in, in Qt now. So it's easy to see how that could be extended to uh, controlling things in VR, or right. at, at least being an interface, an interface, a user interface in VR. Right. So yeah, I think, I think that's, that's a good point. Uh, oh, that's, that, that's <laughs> so. <laughs> Yeah, so you talked about gaze tracking, but I think the what's actually tracked is the direction of the head. So do uh, you so see any possibility to, to maybe if you if you look on the upper right corner into your view to make the cursor move with Uh so so right now at least with the headsets there is no eye tracking. So you actually have to physically move your head. Uh like so like it's kinda like wearing goggles. So it's, it doesn't matter where your eyes move. Your eyes are always facing forward, uh, but the gaze is actually where my head is oriented in, okay. in that thing. So that, that's what it's actually tracking. So uh, you'd get it from the pose of the headset, the forward vector of the headset. That's where the gaze tracking is going to do its picking from. Okay. Hey. <clears throat> so I don't have a lot of exposure with VR, but I'm very interested in this new technology, and we have an entirely new uh, dimension in which to design user interfaces, you know, the third dimension. Uh, do you find that people are, are reevaluating good UI or, or interesting, you know, what we've considered fundamental two-dimensional UI practices and, and design fundamentals with this new uh, newfound field, if you will. So I think I think there's two parts to that. One is that, or one that I discovered was that uh, 
uh, only working on like basically 2D user interfaces is that like this game development and 3D simulation world, they've already been exposed to this for years. And uh, you know, that, that's a lot of what I discussed in the beginning is that like they've already thought of all these ways to think about user interfaces in 3D. Uh, and then the VR, uh, I think, is where your kind of question comes in, is like now uh, with VR, there's even more uh, importance on good UI design in 3D because a bad, a bad user experience in VR means that not only are they not going to use your app anymore because potentially it makes them sick, but they're not going to use anyone's VR applications anymore because they're going to associate VR with you know, an ill feeling, a sickness, uh, you know, uncomfortableness. So I think it is super important now that VR and even AR are available that uh, you, UI and user experience are critical to you know, people actually using your product. I guess uh, <clears throat> to follow up, I was thinking more in general when we deal with menus and whatnot. We, we deal with 2-dimensional tables and buttons, but that's always been built on top of a two-dimensional screen. Now that we have a third dimension, if you're working on a, on a workflow or an application, something for productivity, how do you leverage this newfound space? And I was just curious as to what the, what the thoughts in the field were on that. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that's definitely something that we're looking into as well, because I mean, we so far have been only focused on 2D user interface elements. And even in this presentation, I only showed flat user interfaces. Mm -hmm. So uh, now that we have this new dimension, and especially with VR and AR, uh, it is actually possible and you know, something we need to think about of like, what do spatial UIs look like? Uh, 3D controls, uh, how will that look in the future? And, and that is something that at least uh, us at the Cute Company are thinking about now and seeing what is actually possible and, and experimenting with that. But I think we're, we're kind of at the point now where we're building the foundation that that, that stuff will be, will be built on. Uh, so, so that's where we're at now. But it is in there, it's in our minds. Cool. Okay, any others? All right, thanks Andy very much. And thank you. And thank everyone. <laughs>